Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, emotions run high as both Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh and the woman accusing him of sexual assault to give conflicting testimony marked by anger and anguish. The state legislature adopts one of the strictest anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policies in the nation. New Jersey kicks off a $20 million grant program that's expected to help 13,000 community college students pay tuition. Well, it's official. Workers at New York and New Jersey's three major airports will receive a higher minimum wage than in any city or state in the country. Plus, a first-of-its-kind partnership that helps medical examiners and medical students. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. We start with a high stakes hearing in Washington. The Senate Judiciary Committee looking into accusations of sexual abuse by a judge nominated to the highest court in the land. Senior correspondent David Cruz has been following the extraordinary proceedings. David? Mary Alice, it was difficult to watch, beginning with dramatic testimony from Christine Blasey Ford, the woman accusing Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault in 1982. Much anticipated and watched by millions across the country, today's hearing highlighted the great divide not only between the Kavanaugh and Blasey Ford stories, but between Democrats and Republicans on the committee, with no less than a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land at stake. In a morning session, which lasted almost four hours, Blasey Ford projected a vulnerability that drew sympathy from Democrats and seemed to stymie Republicans who had hired a female prosecutor to do their questioning. I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe, and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. My family and I have been the target of constant harassment and death threats, and I have been called the most vile and hateful names imaginable. Is what you're doing for our nation right now, besides giving testimony germane to one of the most sacred obligations of our offices, is you are speaking truth that this country needs to understand. And how we deal with survivors who come forward right now is unacceptable. But uh, you talked about the obstruction from the other side. I ca cannot let it go by what you've heard me say so many times that between July 30th and September 13th, there were 45 days this committee could have been investigating this situation and uh, her privacy would have been protect protected. So something happened here in between on your side that the whole country, well, not the whole country should have known about it. No, not know about it. We should have investigated it. In the afternoon session, which is ongoing, it was an angry, defiant Judge Kavanaugh, driven to tears at several points, who not only denied the charges against him, but blasted the confirmation process, taking aim at Democrats on the committee for perpetuating what he called a national disgrace and a circus. He warned that the repercussions to the country would be felt for decades. This confirmation process has become a national disgrace. The Constitution gives the Senate an important role in the confirmation process, but you have replaced advice and consent with search and destroy. Since my nomination in July, there has been a frenzy on the left to come up with something, anything, to block my confirmation. Shortly after I was nominated, the Democratic Senate leader said he would, quote, 
oppose me with everything he's got. A Democratic senator on this committee publicly, publicly referred to me as evil. I categorically and unequivocally de deny the allegation against me by Dr. Ford. I never had any sexual or physical encounter of any kind with Dr. Ford. I never attended a gathering like the one Dr. Ford describes in her allegation. I've never sexually assaulted Dr. Ford or anyone. Again, I am not questioning that Dr. Ford may have been sexually assaulted by some person in some place at some time, but I've never done that to her or to anyone. What happens next? That is unknown. There was a committee vote scheduled for tomorrow, but it's not for certain whether the vote may be delayed. Democrats are still calling for an FBI investigation, and they want to hear from more witnesses. And looming is the president, who said that he would be watching today. One tweet from him could change the entire trajectory of these historic proceedings. Mary Alice. Thank you, David. With the hearings as a backdrop, New Jersey lawmakers have adopted their first new anti-harassment policy in nearly a decade, the first of the Me Too era. Brianna Vernozzi reports. So every woman and every man who walks through these halls, who works for the state legislature or the Office of Legislative Services, will be bound by this policy. And they will know that we have a safe environment here. At a State House press conference, an emotional Senator Loretta Weinberg said today felt appropriate to update the anti harassment and anti discrimination policies. It's the first such overhaul in nearly a decade that'll require, among other items, mandatory training for all lawmakers, staff, and lobbyists every two years. This is a good policy whose time has come. The fact that it, there are 80 people on the bill here in, in the assembly, every Democrat, every Republican is either a sponsor or co-sponsor, um, speaks to the fact that this is a policy that got it right, uh, that is, is going to do uh, much for, to protect workers' rights. This should happen more often, where Democrats and Republicans come together. This is what New Jersey and America needs, a unified front by their governments. The new rules mean the findings of an investigation into misconduct can be made public through an Oprah request if the complainant agrees. Lawmakers say the actions aren't a direct result of allegations at the State House, at least not in the last two decades or more. By explicitly listing examples of prohibited conduct, we're eliminating much of the gray area that sometimes hide or protect abusive behavior. We're making clear that discrimination and sexual harassment will not be tolerated in the New Jersey legislature. We started working on this uh, in, in January. Uh, we've had conversations and had drafts uh, throughout the, the, you know, those ensuing months until now. This is the first session we have after, after uh, summer. So. Uh, the, the timing is w what it is, but that's happenstance. Lawmakers heightened their push for new legislation as the Me Too movement gripped the country, and a national study by the Associated Press found New Jersey's existing sexual harassment policy was among the weakest in the nation. I believe that women will feel that, that they are um, supported in some sort of way. They have a go-to person that they can actually, and it's really well, well spelled out in the policy, that they actually have somebody that they can go to to tell. And then Democratic lawmaker Pam Lampett had her own powerful moment on the assembly floor. So I stand here in front of everybody, very conflicted about what I'm going to say next, but I'm going to say, me too. Then joined by other members of the legislature. The rules passed both houses today and go into effect immediately. As Speaker Coughlin reiterated, the vote and the timing of the legislation had nothing to do with the hearings in Washington, but it's certainly fitting. At the State House, Brianna Venozzi, NJTV News. At a major announcement about tuition free college, Governor Murphy weighed in on the impact of the Kavanaugh hearings and the credibility of his accuser. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. If she's got extraordinary courage, who could say otherwise? 
that she's incredibly credible by any assessment. Governor Murphy spoke with deep emotion about Christine Blasey Ford's testimony at a news conference about community college tuition grants. Murphy criticized the committee's hearing process. This prosecutorial mindset of the, and the presumption that you're guilty uh, as a woman who raises her hand and says something happened to me ought to have all of us, all, ought to have all of our hair on fire, not just women, but men and women. It's completely unacceptable. It angers me deeply. Murphy, whose wife during the women's march in January told her own story of being sexually attacked at college, ripped the Republican line of questions to Ford. Well, you claim you don't like flying, but how did you get here today? Well, who the hell are you to ask that question? I mean, come on. The presumption is they're picking at her case uh, to, to try to try to call her out, try to prove that she's not telling the truth. The presumption ought to be she is telling the truth. Murphy emphasized he's not a Brett Kavanaugh supporter and said the Supreme Court nominee should, quote, pack up and leave town or else endure a full bore investigation by the FBI. He pointed out it's a lifetime appointment. This is a one way ticket and we better damn well get it right. Applause from the crowd at Union County College, one of 13 New Jersey community colleges that will participate in a new $20 million tuition grant program that could benefit 13,000 students, Murphy announced. New Jersey's community colleges play a critical role in building the skill set needed to meet the demands of a growing, diverse, and innovative economy. We give people a path to the middle class. We are all about economic mobility. Murphy originally wanted tuition-free community colleges, but had to dial that back when the legislature balked at his original $50 million proposal during a contentious budget process. In this program, applicants' family income can't exceed $45,000, and grants will pay the rest of the bill after all other aid is applied. Students must be enrolled at least half time to participate. And these students will be required, I don't want to sound too much like a dad here, to maintain satisfactory academic progress to remain eligible. So folks, you can't mail it in. Senate Minority Leader Tom Kane said free community college sounds great, but nothing is free. Governor Murphy's plan merely shifts the expense of tuition to New Jersey taxpayers at an estimated cost of $200 million to $400 million when the program is fully implemented. The tuition grant program kicks off in the spring semester. Students will have until February 15th to apply for the program. In Cranford, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. A plastic bag ban tops tonight's business news. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, it is a legislative victory for environmentalists. A bill that would impose a statewide ban on plastic products has been unanimously approved by the Senate Environment Committee. The measure would ban plastic grocery store bags, plastic straws, and styrofoam food containers. It would also impose a 10 cent fee on paper bags at grocery stores. Business groups oppose this bill, saying it would hurt their members who would have to buy more expensive alternatives to plastic. The bill still needs to be heard in the full Senate and Assembly. Republican lawmakers in Washington are voicing concerns about sports betting in New Jersey and elsewhere. At a hearing today in the House Judiciary Subcommittee, GOP members said they're worried about online gambling platforms targeting minors. This is the first congressional hearing on sports betting since the Supreme Court legalized it. But at this time, no bill has been introduced that would enact any reforms. Some welcome news, though, for anyone who's flown recently on those increasingly cramped airplanes. The House approved a bill that would allow federal regulators to set minimum standards for seat size and leg room on flights. Airlines over the years have been adding seats as a way to increase profits. This proposed bill is designed to ensure that crowded planes can be evacuated quickly in case of an emergency. That legislation heads next to the Senate. There's a new email scam aimed at stealing paychecks from workers who get paid through direct deposit. The FBI says cyber criminals are using phishing emails to obtain the online login credentials of workers. Once they get those credentials, the criminals access workers' online payroll systems and change their bank account information. 
direct deposits are then redirected to a bank account owned by the scammer. The FBI says the cyber criminals also take action so that victims don't receive any alerts about changes to their bank account information. The agency says some of the most targeted institutions in this particular scam are education and health care. Jersey City's massive Bayfront redevelopment project takes another step forward. Last night, the city council voted in favor of an agreement to buy 70 acres of land and issue $170 million in bonds to cover the cost, according to reports. The redevelopment project, which would take several years to build, would be the largest mixed-use facility in Jersey City in decades. Turning now to Wall Street, we saw modest gains for stocks with the Dow up about 55 points. And those are your top business stories. $19 an hour. That's the new minimum wage the Port Authority has voted to phase in for some 40,000 low-wage airport workers. The action comes after years of protests and pressure from people employed by private contractors servicing the airports. Raven Santana reports. Motion carries. Nearly 100 airport workers from Newark, LaGuardia, and Kennedy erupted in cheer after Port Authority announced that it unanimously approved raises for all 40,000 workers. We want to do it right. That's why we took the extra step. So you want to be critical, be critical. But we're doing the right thing. We're moving ahead. So it is bulletproof. The wage boost to $19 an hour would be phased in by 2023. Under the approved plan, in November, airport workers will make $12.45 an hour. That'll be increased to $15.60 on September 1, 2019, with additional annual increases, until the wage reaches $19 an hour on September 1, 2023. A victory also for New York, where both LaGuardia and Kennedy airport workers will get similar increases. The simple, undeniable truth is too many working men and women and middle-class people are fulfilling their side of the bargain, but they are not enjoying a decent living. That is the undeniable truth. When we fight, we and we won. When we fight, we win. I've been living in one apartment with my family for the past 10 years. But with this coming up now, I believe I'll live in a mansion. Union officials say the increased wage won't just reduce turnover, it'll also increase sales at local businesses. Workers at this level who now have a little bit of spending money are going to spend that money in their community. It's workers who now care about their jobs and it's, you know, it's sort of sad that the, that the airline industry is still fighting this and trying to pit passengers and workers against the airlines as if they are on opposite sides when we're trying to create a better airport and a better experience for everybody. But not everyone was satisfied by the Port Authority's progress. During the public forum, Newark Mayor Raz Baraka took issue with how he says the agency proposed to redesign Port Street, which is owned by the city without their permission or participation. We're we just not going to allow it to happen. And people know if I'm talking, that means I mean it. I'm not saying it just to breathe. Uh, we're not going to allow Port Authority to come onto our property, city property, and develop or do anything for that matter without our consent, without our discussion, without moving forward on issues that we think are important to us. It's just not going to happen. Even if I have to put garbage trucks on Port Street, it'll never happen. I'm telling you that right now, and I'd rather let you know in advance before we throw tea in the harbor. While the Port Authority board listened to the mayor, it did not have a response to the claims. In Jersey City, Raven Santana, NJTV News. Denuclearizing the nation's oldest nuclear plant. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Lacey Township, where all spent nuclear fuel has been removed from the shuttered Oyster Creek Generating Station. It was shut down 10 days ago. Now the owner, Exelons, notified the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It removed the last of the fuel rods Tuesday and put them in metal racks at the bottom of a 40-foot deep pool with thick steel reinforced walls and a stainless steel liner in temperature-controlled circulating water infused with boron to help inhibit nuclear fission. After several years, the fuel would be placed into sealed concrete casts for longer-term storage on the Oyster Creek grounds. Another company, Holtec International, plans to buy the plant and move the fuel to another disposal facility. Next to Folsom, 
home of a world-class artist. E.B. Lewis had already illustrated more than 50 children's books when he started to illustrate history. It started with a 2016 book about civil rights leader John Lewis. Then to one of the biggest projects of his life, more than 100 watercolor paintings depicting real stories of underground railroad freedom seekers and abolitionists that were turned into animated films playing inside the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center in upstate New York. Mr. Lewis was able to, quote, put a footprint in this story, our story. Finally, Jersey City exhuming buried treasure. Steve Minetti won an abandoned storage unit at auction and discovered inside remnants of the 1970s soul group, The Escorts, including signed records, clothes, signed contracts, and photo albums. The Escorts short-lived musical career was launched by members serving time in Trenton State Prison. The seven-member soul band was transferred to Rahway State Prison, where they first performed in a prison talent show, got discovered by a record producer, and recorded five singles while incarcerated, including the 1973 single, All We Need Is Another Chance. Now their stuff has another chance. And that's the Garden State Express for Thursday, September 27th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. The long-troubled state medical examiner system that investigates the causes of suspicious, violent, unexplained, or unexpected deaths is undergoing an overhaul. As part of the reforms, the Bergen County Medical Examiner's Office is now being run by Rutgers University in a partnership that both serves a critical function for the state and opens a training ground for medical students. Leah Mishkin reports. The partnership between Bergen County and Rutgers New Jersey Medical School is a first of its kind in New Jersey. Rutgers faculty will lead the medical examiner's office. So that way we'll be able to attract the best forensic pathologists in the country. Students from the pathology program in turn will receive training at the medical examiner's office as part of their residency. Being able to better understand and uncover the full circumstances around that death can help bring closure to families while giving us the tools and knowledge to hopefully prevent future deaths. The county executive says this partnership allows Bergen County to stay ahead of the medical examiner shortage the country faces. The, the difficulty is you have to be licensed in New Jersey, you have to under, understand New Jersey laws, and many of them, um, because of the, the pay inequities, I mean, some of these people are demanding four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars and $500,000 a year. And, uh, you know, we're just not able to, to pay that kind of money. The lack of people entering the field is a national problem. The shortage was highlighted in an NJ Advance Media investigation about a year ago. Journalist Stephen Sterling and S.P. Sullivan looked at medical examiner offices across the state and discovered a system that had been neglected for a number of years. There wasn't really a cohesive system. Uh, most of them were understaffed, uh, you know, and uh, the, the caseloads that they were taking on were just too much for the staff to bear, and it led to really long waiting times, which, you know, if you're a family that's waiting for for word of how your loved one died can be really devastating. And we also uncovered several instances where, uh, you know, a, a medical examiner may have gotten uh, a, a ruling wrong. Sterling says many people they interviewed believed it was ideal to pair a medical examiner's office with a university. So one of the best ways that you can sort of guarantee that you will uh, perhaps, uh, you know, have people at least, you know, available to you and, uh, you know, you know, familiar with your system that are available to be employed is to partner with a local uh, uh, local university uh, program. And that's, you know, that's what Bergen County's done here. Sterling says Bergen County met national criteria, and most of the people they interviewed saw the county as a well-run medical examiner's office. What we've been able to do here in Bergen County has continued to set us apart, and then this is just another extension of, of that. The Bergen County Executive believes this partnership with Rutgers New Jersey Medical School will be a model other counties in the state 
will soon follow. In Hackensack, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And now some noteworthy facts to help you know Jersey. The New Jersey legislature's anti-harassment policy approved by both houses updates the previous version enacted in 2009. Cory Booker is the only member of the Senate Judiciary Committee from New Jersey. The union says the $19 minimum wage airport workers will earn by 2023 is the highest minimum wage in the country. And the escorts formed while the group members were all serving time in Trenton State Prison. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, a ceremony to spotlight juvenile justice policy. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities.